Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father, grant now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, without embarrassing a certain lady who's here this morning, when we moved here back in 1988, uh, our two kids were settling into local schools, and it was then that the full reality of what they'd missed in schooling, especially back where we'd lived in East London for a, a decade or more, began to filter through. And my son at that time was really struggling with maths. But this dear lady, who I won't embarrass naming her, but she's sitting up there in the balcony, whatever. <laughs> she said, I can help your boy. I'm a maths tutor. So every week, my young son, Paul, went for extra maths tuition. You can imagine how happy he was about this arrangement. And then he seemed to take off like, uh, you know, a Harrier jump jet, boom, vertically. He was really doing well. And a friend said, your boy's doing really well at maths, isn't he? Do you know why? I said, yeah, <laughs> you're excellent tuition for him. Oh, she said, I wish it was that simple. He, you see, the maths book he's using has got the answers at the back. He's been writing them down. He got one out of kilter and he just continued. And if you moved them all down one, they were all the correct answers. I think I might've taken him out for a celebratory ice cream. Because my son had learned a lesson that too few of us as Christians, especially in COVID, have learned. He knew that no, no matter what the problem, the arithmetic, the algebra, the geometry, it really, they could have thrown calculus at him. He really didn't care because he knew if he turned to the back, he got the answer. And if we turn to the back of our Bibles, we get the answer to this dilemma called life that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's on the throne of the universe, and there is no power can conquer you when God is on your side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And the answer is, all hell may be against us. It doesn't really matter because something has happened in space-time history. God has raised his son from the dead and everything is different and everything is new. And one day, all things shall be new again. That's the wonderful story of the book of Revelation where Christians are suffering for their faith and it looks like the might of the Roman Empire is just going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Where is that today? Nowhere. And kingdoms will rise and fall and empires will come and go. But the throne of Christ and the kingdom of God will last forever. That's why I want to focus you in here on Revelation chapter 1 this morning. For John himself is in some difficulties. Here's our first thought. Be clear. Be clear that being a Christian in this world is a troublous thing. After all, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, John 16. And if you look at chapter 1, verse 9, it says, I, your brother, in the suffering, it's the same word, and the kingdom and the patient endurance. I, John, he's an old man. He's in a place he didn't want to be in. He's in Patmos. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom. That's Christian faith. That's authentic Christian experience. It's suffering. It's pressure. It's tribulation. It's difficulties. It's heartbreak on the one side. And then he says, and it's the kingdom. Because God in Christ has broken into space-time history. He has come for the salvation of the world. He has come to make all things new. His power and his rule. That's what kingdom means. And what holds it together is, he says, and the patient endurance. We've just got to hang on in there. That's the point. When life is tough, when it goes pear-shaped, when it didn't work out as you wanted, what do you do? And John says, I'm in the Isle of Patmos. He was a prisoner, almost certainly of the Roman Empire. 
a little sweating out his final years in, a, in, in, in the ore mines there of this little tiny spot in the Aegean Sea. And he says, I was in the Isle of Patmos. I was having a meal with somebody recently who was going through a trauma. Unexpectedly, they'd lost their job. And they're kind of, it's sixes and sevens. And I reached across the, the meal table and I grasped their arm and I said, John, this is your Patmos. John the Apostle didn't choose to be in a holiday island like Grand Cayman. <laughs> Patmos was a prison. Are you in a Patmos this morning? Wish you weren't there. Wonder how you got there. Wonder how it's all going to work out. Wonder why God could possibly, if he really loves you, could allow this to happen. And that's why we need patient endurance. Be clear, in this world we will have trials and tribulations. But here's the second major thing. Not only be clear, but know this, he's near. For as John's in a position he didn't wish to be in, we often used to say man, we'd say a person today inclusively, man's extremity is God's opportunity. God often meets us in the hard and difficult and dark places of life because he's got our attention then. When everything is sunlit and everything is wonderful and everything is cool and going fine, oh, we can just forget the important things. But now it's tough. And John has this revelation. If he'd never been in the place of Patmos, we'd never have had this incredible and complex book. And he says, while I was there, I heard a voice. God speaks and we are to listen. And he says, and I turn to hear the voice. When we're in trials and difficulties, we need to stop and turn and listen. Lord, what is it you're saying to me? And as he turns to listen, he discovers that the Lord Jesus is there. John was, was the nearest, perhaps, disciple ever to Jesus, physically, and the disciple who, whom Jesus loved and who loved Jesus by tradition, I take it too. He wrote the Gospel of John, Revelation, three epistles, five of the 27 documents in the New Testament. But this day, he gets a vision of Christ that is so overwhelming because, you see, there's always more about Jesus to know. No matter how well you know him, there's always more. There's the unsearchable riches of Christ, according to Ephesians 3, verse 8. That means unmappable, unfathomable, never come to the end of all of riches of Christ. If you think you've got Jesus buttoned up, you've got the wrong Jesus. This Jesus here defies, as it almost, it defies predication. How does he fit together? And John just looks, and when he gets this vision of Jesus, let's just pick up a, a few sort of elements of this. That's all we can do. And he says, and as I turned amongst the land stands, verse 13, was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, etc. And then he says, verse 14, and his head and his hair were white like wool. Oh, that's important because the Old Testament, you see, is our grammar book, our vocabulary book, our our phrase book for the New Testament. That's why we need the whole Bible. And here he says, I saw his head and his hair were white like wool. Who's like that? Well, back in the book of Daniel, it's the Lord God Almighty. Unless we miss it, Jesus then says, I am the first and the last in verse 17. Who's the first and the last? Isaiah tells us 44 verse 6. It's Yahweh. It's the great I am. So this is our Lord's deity. Jesus Christ isn't a good man. He isn't a great man or a great prophet. He's the God man. That puts him in a unique category. He's the God who came to earth. And how did he do that? Now, the word means more than this, but notice he's one like a son of man. There's more to say about that, and that's another phrase from Daniel chapter 7. But whatever else it means, and it means far more than I'm going to mention right now, Son of man means that that one who is absolute deity shares our humanity. Lo, within the manger lies he who built the starry skies. 
that is one who has stepped into our space and time. It's what we call Christmas. It's the incarnation. It's the coming of God in human form. The word who was God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He understands us. He's one of us. Has humanity a future off the back of COP26? You know, everybody's panicking. Of course, humanity's got a future. God has taken a human nature into himself forever. Our future is secure as a human race because Jesus Christ is the son of God and the son of man. But then there's a third element, just the sheer majesty of this person, his feet, verse 15, were like bronze glowing in a furnace. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. This is meant to just evoke in us the sheer majesty of Christ. It's one thing to be intimate with Jesus, and that's what we're called to. But that's not cheap familiarity. This is the Lord. He is his majesty. Never domesticate the Lord Jesus. He's not one amongst the many. He stands unique, supreme, preeminent. Lord, there is none like you. I could search my whole eternity through and find there is none like you. Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God, Lord of eternity, dwells with humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. And that one, too, in his majesty, has an inexpressible beauty. Verse 16, and his face was like the sun shining in all its strength. Why are you here? Where's it going? What's this salvation thing about? We hear a lot rightly about forgiveness. But that's only half the story. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and to restore us. You and I could not possibly stand before a holy God as we are. We're we're fallen, broken people. We we don't have the capacity even for it. We couldn't no no more than we could just gaze at the sun in all its brilliance. And when John sees Jesus, he's overwhelmed. But here's the story of the gospel. He has come so that you and I may one day see the very face of God. What is the goal of salvation? That you're forgiven? No. The goal of salvation is Revelation 22, and his servants will see his face. Didn't Jesus say? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? Hello, anybody out there? They shall see God. That's what you're here for. If you become a Christian, you're being prepared for the vision of God, to see him. That's what it's about. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about even at one level about the church. It's about God. It's the gospel of God that prepares us for the vision of God. Oh, how shall I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is dim, before the ineffable appear, and on my naked spirit bear the uncreated beam. John captures something of the sheer, astonishing, magnificent beauty of the Lord Jesus, his face shining like the sun. And of course, the scrutiny here too, for his eyes, verse 14, are like blazing fire. You know, there's never been a secret sin. Oh, we think we get away with it. These eyes see everything. We didn't need superheroes like uh, Superman to come with his X-ray vision. The real hero is here. He never sees things. He sees through things. He never sees just what people do. He sees why they do them. He sees not just you and me. He can see right through us. That's an uncomfortable thought because you can't con the Lord. People think they get away with it all the time. (laughs) You know, just fat cats and thin cats as well. Nothing escapes this one. But that leaves us very much to why we need verse 13. Among the lampstands was one 
like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. Now it is possible that the robe here could be a judge's robe. So the one with eyes of fire sees us and we're in for the long eternal drop. We're lost. It's scrutiny. But almost certainly the echo here is not of the judge in his robes. But it's the high priest. Back to Exodus. You'll have to read it at your leisure. 28 and chapters 29. The high priest who stands with mercy for his people. He is the go-between. When they use the word high priest in Latin, they called him Pontifex Maximus. Maximus means the greatest. Pontifex literally means the bridge builder. Jesus Christ is the bridge builder between a holy God and sinful humanity. He is the perfect bridge builder. He's the perfect mediator, and he's the perfect high priest. What does that mean? Because he's one of us, he sure understands us. He sure sympathizes with us. He sure knows every movement and brokenness of our hearts. That's why I love that hymn, Before the Throne of God Above. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, his name is, my name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no voice can bid me thence depart when Satan tempts me to despair. Tells me of the, the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because the sinless Savior died. My sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. May I ask you this morning, are you sheltering in Christ like that? Are you in Christ? Have you turned to him and said, Lord, I know if you look at me, I, I'm done. But thank you that there is a substitute. There is a savior. There's, there's one I can hide in. And you do that by coming to him and giving yourself to him and believing that he died for sinners and therefore he died for people like you and me that we might be saved forever and hide in him no matter what, even when all hell breaks loose against us, we feel he stands unique and supreme before the throne of God for us. There is none like him. And as we close, be clear, he's near. So why fear? Because there's immense amount of fear around in our world today. And COVID's only added to that. Perfect storms and global warming and are we all going to kind of drown or whatever? Let me tell you, if you think you've got problems worrying about rising sea levels in Bournemouth, try K-Man. I had to take my driving test. And say, so I've seen you drive, Steve. I don't think that's a bad idea. Now, I had to take it to get a Cayman license and learn about hill starts again, just a written test. The highest elevation in Cayman is about 60 feet. I didn't know where I could practice hill starts. Pardon? What, what's all that about? Well, if the oceans rise, we're just a disaster waiting to happen. They just go up a couple of feet. We live through hurricanes. What's going to happen in the world? Do you know what? I try not to give it at one level a second thought. I want to be a responsible steward. I want to live properly as a Christian, of course. This is God's world. That's absolutely right. But uh, I'm not going to be filled with all the prognostications of hearing crisis, crisis, crisis. The only crisis I'm concerned about, and this is the truth, crisis in Greek means judgment. 
is the judgment of God. And in Christ, that judgment's been taken away. So I can do what these verses now say as we close. So why fear? Well, the first thing is, when I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet as though dead, and he placed his right hand on me. (laughs) Oh, what sympathy. Just that touch of Christ, that makes all the difference in this world and the next. The touch of Christ on this man, physically, of course. We, we're trying to get used to social distancing and, you know, we have to be respectful of each other's predilections in that. But isn't it wonderful for me coming back just this week and seeing the grandkids and the family and being able to give them a hug? Well, here, the Son of God touches John physically. And we're together that we may know the touch of Christ by his spirit upon us here spiritually this morning. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that filled my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Many of us as Christians have forgotten the nearness the dearness and the touch of Christ upon our lives because we're so full of fear. We can hardly feel anything. But he is one who comes in sympathy and he reminds us, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and hell. What tragedy. He died. We've sung about it. We've rehearsed it. Here, the Son of God, in pain and shame and ignominy and rejection, he suffers and bleeds and dies for sins not his own, so we the guilty go free. Wow. But how do you know it's true? I am he who lives and was dead. There's the tragedy. But here, the victory. And now I'm alive forever and ever. Wow. Wow. Lord, you've conquered the grave. This is why the early church expanded. Because you know what? They didn't fear death anymore because they knew the Lord of life. You and I, we live and die. Are we all on the same page on that one? Yeah, no matter who we are, wherever we're coming from, we live and die. Here is the qualitative difference. Jesus Christ died and now lives forevermore. He'll never die again. It's not a resuscitation. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen and alive forevermore. And he says, because I live, you will live also. Wow, we've heard of deaths this week. Those in Christ now with the Lord, nothing and no one anywhere, anytime ever will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But then he says, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Do you believe that? These are the keys to the car I'm borrowing while I'm back. They get me into the the vehicle. I'm not quite sure how on earth to get into it without it, and I'm certainly not sure what half the things in the car do at the moment either. I'm driving by faith, not by sight, if you understand. Jesus says, I have the keys of death and hell. I have the keys of destiny. Can I give you a piece of alarming, wonderful news? If Jesus has the keys of death and hell, here's the news. You and I, we're going to die on time. Hello? You can't dodge it. You cannot add one nanosecond to your life. You can do all you like. You can keep as fit as a fiddle. But as George Bernard Shaw said, the statistics on death are most impressive. One out of one people die. You are going to die if the Lord doesn't come back. And people say, oh, if your cholesterol's high, you're going to die. Well, let me tell you, if your cholesterol's low, you're still going to go, right? (laughs) That's just the bottom line. Just get over it. If Jesus has the keys of my destiny and I'm going to die on time, then here's the challenge. 
I'm therefore supposed to be living in time for him till he comes for me or he comes again in power and glory. Not being intimidated by saying, oh, am I going to get through this? Yes, you are. Because if the Lord decides you're going to die today, have a great eternity. And if he's decided you've got another 100 years or you're going to make Methuselah's age, fine. Make sure you're living. I love Hebrews 11, 13. These were all living by faith when they died. I know some people, they died at 35 and they didn't, weren't buried till they were 95. They were dead for years. Make sure you're living by faith. And some of us older ones here, I'm part of your august company. <sighs> Are you still living by faith? Wrapping yourself up in cotton wool and, oh, I've got to be careful this time. What is it you're saving yourself for? I don't mean to be, uh, uh, you know, absurd here or, you know, or I'll take up hang gliding at 90 or something, you know, or scuba diving off Boscombe Beach or something, you know. We do funerals for free if you do that. But I'm just saying life is for the living. Life is for taking risks. And especially as we get older, rather than wrapping ourselves in cotton wool and trying to preserve everything, we've got to say, look, Jesus has the keys of my destiny. I'm going to live responsibly. I'm going to live Christianly, but I'm not going to live fearfully. He says, do not fear. And as we close, that's the thing. He says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. He's the living one. I fell at his feet and he said, don't be afraid. Many years ago now, and I used to sit in listening to students making their way through a sermon class, they'd get 15 minutes and then we'd take it apart and then another one, 15 minutes and a 50 minute lecture. And this student was in full flow. And we never stopped them at 15 minutes. This is the only time I wanted to jump in immediately because they said this, do you know there are 365 fear nots in the Bible, or equivalent. And I wanted to jump in and say, excuse me, it isn't enough. Because I've got this real clever devil. And he comes to me and he says, that's right, Steve Brady. But actually, have you thought of the 29th of February? Leap year? Groundhog day? And today, Steve Brady, in your experience, it's the 29th of February. I say, no, it's, it's, it's the 14th of November. No, 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 no. It's always going to be the 29th of February. So be afraid. Be very afraid. Somebody else did the maths. Or I can't get my head around it. I keep talking about the math where I live. The maths. And come up with 366 fear knots or equivalent in the Bible. That will do me nicely. Over every day of my life, I need to hear the words of the risen, conquering Lord. Do not be afraid. Stop being afraid. How to cope at the end of your rope? Be clear. Life is full of troubles. It's called life. But he's near. So why fear? Because he has the keys of our destiny. He's the magnificent, mighty, all-conquering Lord. And he will see you through your Patmos or whatever else you're going through from here to eternity. In Liverpool, there's a famous place called the Walker Art Gallery but we don't know it as that. It's called the Walker Art Gallery. And if you go to the Walker Art Gallery, as many kids had to do, you can go and have a look at W.F. Eames's famous painting. It's a Victorian artist, but it's set in the Cromwellian days of a young boy being interviewed, <laughs> put it mildly, by the Roundheads. They want to know where his royalist father is. And in the background, his mother and sister, they're looking very worried because the, and the kid's standing on a box before this interviewing officer. And the title of the painting is this. And when did you last see your father? 
And when did you last see this Savior? When did you last look full in his wonderful face? And when was the last time the things of earth as a result grew strangely dim? For they will in the light of his glory and grace. How to cope at the end of your rope. Remember Jesus Christ. Let's pray. At your feet we fall, mighty risen Lord, as we come before your throne to worship you. And we do. We stand in awe of your immensity, of your wondrous nature that is none like you, the great God-man who died for our sins and rose again triumphant and ever lives to make intercession for us and will come in power and glory to make all things new. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we worship you. And for those of us who are wrapped up in fear and wondering why you've left us in this patmos of our situation, those of us with broken hearts and broken dreams and now sightless spiritual vision. Lord, please write afresh your truth into our hearts and recalibrate our vision so that we may go from this place, not putting our problems between you and ourselves, but seeing you between ourselves and whatever else we face and through that wonderful prismatic of your grace, finding grace to help us in our time of need. And for those of us, Lord, still on the periphery, we've not yet come home to you. In these quiet moments, if you are all that this passage says, then Lord, I come just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for people like me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. I come. In Jesus' name, amen.